This video is my take on the new Panasonic 12-35mm f2.8 zoom lens. Micro 4.3 users have long moaned about the lack of high-end fixed aperture standard zooms. Now they've got one. It comes at a price. The question is, is it worth it? That will always be a subjective judgement and one I can't answer for anyone else. But keep in mind that the Nikkor 24-70 is a third more, so M4.3 users are not too hard done by. This lens costing about £900, $1299 or €1200 Euros on Amazon. There are plenty of standard zooms about from both Panasonic and Olympus, but they tend to be f3.5 to 5.6 or even slower, and so have limited all round use, at night or on very dull days for example. There was wishful thinking that this might be an f2 zoom, but I never thought that likely. It would make the cost sky high and compromise the essential advantages of the M43 format, compact size and weight. So, here we have a 12-35mm to zoom with a fixed aperture of f2.8. There is something somehow right about a fixed aperture zoom. A lens that changes its maximum aperture as you zoom always feels a bit out of control to me. If I'm shooting at the lowest speed I know I can reliably handhold, I don't want to find I'm shooting below that because the lens has shut itself down. It's probably a problem more in the mind than reality, but it's there nagging away even so. So, how does Panasonic's flagship zoom shape up? The first thing to say is that it looks very handsome, a dusky deep grey or black depending on how the light catches it. Quite sexy in its way, it makes you want to touch it. Pick it up and it feels solid, almost like it has been machined, though the body is plastic. The lens mount is in metal though. It feels surprisingly heavy which adds to the overall air of quality. It weighs in at just over 300 grams or 10 ounces, so actually is not that heavy. On the camera, it's a nice size to wrap your hand around. The zoom action is outstandingly smooth and well weighted and doesn't creep when held downwards. The focus ring is in front of the zoom ring and silky smooth. It's a fly-by-wire job though, so it doesn't stop turning when you reach infinity or closest focus. On the side is the Power OIS on-off slider, which um, turns the stabiliser on or off. The front glass is quite big and in my mind it makes sense to protect it with a filter, even if only to protect its resale value. The lens was a small petal design affair, and take my advice, use it. Not just to keep light off the lens, which it does effectively enough, I guess. But I'd had this lens four hours when I tilted my tripod forward without checking the camera was clamped in properly. It hit my tiled floor, lens first, with a sickening crunch and bounced for three feet across the floor. When I retrieved it, the lens hood was forced right back on the lens and jammed. Five minutes fiddling and force got it off and I refitted it. There was no damage, not a mark, on the hood, the lens, or the camera body. I have to say that one of my much vaunted old metal Nikkor lenses would almost certainly have been bent or dented by such a fall. It's a tribute to modern materials and manufacture. The Panasonic lens at this 12 to 35 most resembles, in terms of feel and use, is the 14 to 140 mm Panasonic zoom, the wide, the wide range one, and that's one of my favourite lenses. I have an Olympus 12mm f2 lens, and that's the immediate comparison most people make. Performance-wise, I don't think there's much in it. The, the Olympus is probably a little bit sharper at the edges at wide apertures, you know, at 2.8, but stop down a bit, there's not, not much in it with, with, with either of these lenses. The Panasonic does show a bit more barrel distortion at 12mm at the very widest end, but most of that is dialed out without user intervention in the camera software. But it's minimal anyway. Beyond 12mm there's not really any distortion in evidence. Proper bench testing in a lab might show more shortcomings, but for me this lens performs well enough that I may ditch my 12mm Olympus and 25mm Panasonic Summilux. The 12 because this lens is just as good, the Summilux because it isn't superior enough to make me use it in preference. I'll keep my Olympus 45mm, that's a jewel and just the lens for getting the shallow depth of field that everyone seems to crave these days. Uh, for me, a 12mm equivalent to 24 on a full frame camera is wide enough for day to day use. This lens gains 2mm from the more conventional 14 to 42mm um, kit zoom lenses, but it loses out 7mm at the long end. It's a good trade off as far as I'm concerned. The 12mm really makes it a very useful everyday take everywhere lens. The lens does trombone as you zoom towards the long end, but the lens elements do not move in or out or evolve for focusing, so if you use a polarising filter, that's quite useful. A factor in my thinking about replacing the 12mm f2 and 25mm f1.4 Summilax is that though they have wider apertures and can give higher shutter speeds in dim lighting, 
on a Panasonic camera, they don't have image stabilization, so in practice, the stabilized 12 to 35 can be used in similarly low light. If you use Panasonic camera bodies, the chromatic aberration, sort of purple fringing, is taken out in software automatically. But remember that for Olympus users, it will have to be taken out manually where it occurs. That will mostly be in high contrast areas and won't be seen at all in many pictures. A further point is that this lens has a highly efficient image stabiliser built in. Olympus have excellent stabilisation built into the body, so all that money and mechanism is redundant on their cameras. And no, you can't use both at once. Incidentally, using the lens very close up on this butterfly, OIS gives a strange floating effect in the viewfinder. For extreme close-ups, I advise turning it off. That applies to macro lenses too when used close up. For practical purposes, this lens is optically impressive right through the range. There's an acceptable fall off in sharpness at full aperture at the edges, but from my observations, the lens is sharp right across the frame at, from f4. And I mean sharp. If you compare this lens with the kit zooms, it's like you are using a prime by comparison. So to conclude, we have here a well-built, high-quality, high-performance, modern zoom lens. It feels and performs like a professional-grade optic. Lenses like this have to be made to a specification, not a price. If you want cheaper, there are plenty of very acceptable alternatives. For me, this lens will almost permanently be on my camera from now on, replacing my 12 and 25 millimeters. It costs less than the sum of these two, so you could almost regard it as cheap, uh, provided you're a banker, of course. You can limit the depth of field more for that narrow band of sharp focus effect that some people prize so highly with the 12 and 25 millimeter lenses. But in my view, if you want limited depth of field, you shouldn't really be using a wide angle. So I feel the 12 to 35 can completely replace the 12 millimeter. The 25 is a more marginal case. I intend to keep mine and see how much I use it. Certainly the image quality is superb, but I'm not a sharpness fetishist. If, as I suspect, I don't use it very much, then eBay, here it comes. As a rider, I would add that I don't see this lens as a standalone item. When the 35 to 100 to 8 comes out, you have focal lengths from 12 to 100 millimeters, 24 to 200 millimeters in old money, all covered at f2.8. That's a bit of a holy grail for me, and for many people, all the lenses they will need. If you add the 7 and 14 and 1 to 300 millimeter zooms, well, the cup floweth over, as the actress said to the bishop. But back to the lens, my view of this lens is summed up very simply. You get what you pay for. If you add the 7 to 14 and 100 to 300 millimeter zooms to your bag, well, you're covered for almost everything, and my cup floweth over, as the actress said to the bishop. But back to this lens. My view of it is summed up very, very simply. You get what you pay for.